We now have Tobias Kaplan talking to us. He is curator of arms and armour at the Wallace Collection. And he is equally well known as a leading jouster. You may have seen him on television at Leicester in full armour. He was the knight who escorted Richard III's body from Bosworth to be reburied in Leicester Cathedral. And we also have uh, the York Herald here today, Peter, who was also present in Leicester Cathedral at the reburial of uh, Richard III. And may I refer also to Toby's new book, the, uh, some uh, information on the table there, The Armour of the English Knight, 1400 to 1450. So covering our period. Well, thank you. Yes, like uh, many specialists working on medieval Renaissance arms and armor, um, my interest in this subject is really that of a small child uh, gotten a bit out of control. <laughs> uh, nevertheless, um, legacy is about memory. And when we seek to build a legacy, we seek to influence or have some kind of control over the way we or something is remembered. And, and certainly, as we've seen uh, already very well today, uh, Agincourt has been remembered in quite a complicated and uh, contradictory way. And I'm quite interested in that. I'm, I'm fascinated by uh, how it seems that almost as soon as the fighting was over in 1415, there was a divergence between the story of what really happened, and it ultimately only happened one way, and what you might call the myth of Agincourt. Uh, of course, there are many myths, but let's call it one myth as a collective idea for the way we wish it had happened, or the way someone wants you to think it happened usually for their own contemporary purposes, whether it's uh, Shakespeare at the end of the 16th century or Southey or anyone else. Um, most of the discussion of Agincourt has had very little to do with what really happened, at least uh, up until the last 15 or 20 years. And um, for me, a big part of the conception of this event, or the misinterpretation of it, has a very physical nature. The, a medieval battle is a very physical situation, uh, and uh, it's experienced physically, and it is governed by physical laws, and restraints, and capabilities. And the equipment that these people were using and wearing has a lot to do with what could happen and what couldn't have happened, what did happen and what did not happen. And, and I found, looking at this subject, um, you know, when you're standing here in the modern world, you're looking at back to the 15th century through a number of different distorting lenses, ground in different periods to, uh, to uh, disguise the reality of the thing and sort of keep you from from uh, communing with the actual 15th century events. And I've always tried to cut, in my own ways, cut through that and get back to the real experience of the real people who were there. And for me, it's just happened that my own personal uh, uh, methods have been uh, physical ones, looking at the real arms and armor of the time the real equipment, uh, and by extension, the real belief systems and attitudes of the people that were there. Um, a lot of the common misconception of this battle is, is down to a misunderstanding of the equipment. And, and certainly, when you take some of the common <coughs> themes of the myth, the idea, for example, of the English archers as, as, as class warriors, 
uh, fighting by themselves against a horde of uh, aristocrats. Um, you know, you're, you're, you're creating something that doesn't bear very much resemblance to what actually happened. And when you want to create a situation where the French stand for the oppressive, tyrannical aspects of knighthood, uh, the fact that these are people who are out of touch and unable to change with the time and unable to see the reality of the situation and the, the English archers and their magic sticks stand for a kind of moral and intellectual superiority as well as a military one. Then you can use something as physical as the armor and equipment of the knights and exaggerate what it was to serve your own particular purpose which has, again, nothing to do with what actually happened. So, so often, we think of the French knights wearing all of this over-heavy, cumbersome, slightly comical and strange equipment when it's really not, uh, not the equipment for the job. And we forget, of course, that there were 1,500-odd knights and men-at-arms fighting on the English side. They were called the, the backbone of the English army, uh, and without their support, the English archers might have had a much harder time of it. So, um, looking at armor of the early 15th century, it's, a, it's, a, it's an exciting subject because you get to look at all kinds of different sources. Uh, you have to look at all of 15th century culture uh, very holistically. Uh, you have to, of course, read the documents and the chronicles and the inventories and the purchase accounts and all of that. Uh, you also have to look at two-dimensional art, painting, uh, manuscript illustration, um, get, a, get a very good feel for the, the aesthetic and artistic sensibilities of people in, in your particular period. And then with working with something with the, with the pictorial sources, for example, this is a, this is a, a stunning one in the British Library, you can start to look at little technical details that seem to be characteristic of the time in, in, that you're interested in. For example, let's just take randomly this fellow here. One thing that's very characteristic in art of this period is that you see a Y-shaped stop rib or structure on the breastplate. That's very characteristic of this particular period. And when we're interested more, most generally in uh, armor in Europe, uh, during this period, we're fortunate to have a number of pieces surviving. So we can validate what we see in the art and what we hear of described in documents by good surviving material. Good Italian armor survives from this period, um, uh, a few German things, uh, a few things that are probably French. Uh, you know, it's nothing like what survives from the 16th century and later, but there is a basis of real material surviving from this period that we can work from and, and start to understand the real capabilities and equipment of this period. Um, there's one slight problem when you want to work on armor worn by the English in this period, uh, which is that no English armor survives at all, uh, except for one helmet that we'll see a bit later. There might be one other helmet, but they're jousting helmets, they're not war equipment, so we have no war equipment at all. Um, and this is the, this subject for which there is no material evidence is what I've spent 15 years writing books about. <laughs> um, what, what we do have is an extraordinary corpus of surviving funerary sculptures uh, of men in life-sized sculptures of men in arms. Uh, created as part of their funerary monuments. And uh, d looking specifically at the whole 15th century, there are about 230 surviving, uh, specifically armored examples. There are also civilians and clergy and, and, and female effigies and so forth, but the, the men in armor number about 230. Um, and these include some exceptionally good uh, effigies from the actual court period specifically. Some of the best, some of the best effigies, uh, you know, that, that I would consider the best on any on any level date from this period. It's it's really a golden age of the effigy carver's art. And I'd like to focus on just the, this small group today, 
Um, because not only are they an extraordinary illustrations of the equipment of this period, it will help us better understand what really did happen uh, to some extent, but they are also effigies of people who fought at Ashford Court or who were in some way involved um, with that campaign and with Henry V's subsequent campaigns in Normandy. Uh, and I think it's very important, you know, I, I often I often feel that when I, much as I love looking at complete armor in museum cases, uh, and I spend my professional life doing that, um, I can never avoid this uh, feeling in the back of my mind that it's like looking at a picture frame with no picture in it, and that the person is an integral part of this thing. That uh, we must never forget that a complete armor was considered a, decorative and expressive art form, as well as a utilitarian piece of equipment to be used. And it, it is designed to broadcast all kinds of messages, reinforce ideas, build up associations. Uh, it's, a, it's a very powerful art form, and we have to look at it that, in that way as well. And when an artist working in another media faithfully represents an armor, he hijacks all of those capabilities, and the art form stands for the real object. And as I hope to show today briefly, uh, effigy carvers in the 15th century were uh, uh, obsessed almost with the lifelike realism of their creations, and finding ways to blur the distinction in the viewer's mind between what is real flesh and what is carved alabaster. So let's start with our first example. Uh, this is, in, uh, in, I think, one of the best uh, English effigies dating really from the first decade of the 15th century. Uh, this one is a, is a great way of introducing the over riding style of armor that was worn uh, by almost all of the men at arms at, uh, on the English side at Agent Court. And, and you know, it's not absolutely stylistically distinct. There are many points when the, the English equipment is very closely related to what's being worn on the continent. They were very distinct in some ways and very closely related to others. And I'll use this example just to kind of outline the basics of the equipment that we're talking about. Uh, William Willicoat is an interesting character. He was um, uh, he was never knighted. He was an esquire his entire life. But he shows how complex the uh, the English knightly class actually was. That it was a spectrum of of, um, of status and responsibility and behavior. Uh, uh, William. Uh, in 1391 was given a grant uh, from the Exchequer, uh, which refers to him as a king's esquire. Uh, he was a sheriff of Oxford, Shire of Berkshire, and he was also the chief steward of the estates of Queen Anne of Bohemia, Queen of Richard II. Um, as far as I can tell, he never really fought on any military campaign. Uh, and if you read what's known about his life and where he appears in, in, in the records, he seems to be almost exclusively a lawyer and an administrator, and, and not really a soldier at all. But because technically he's a member of the knightly class, the armor goes with the status, and that is the status, that is the social position that needs to be represented on the effigy. And as, and as convincingly as, and as life, in, in a lifelike manner as possible. Uh, the equipment stands for the man and for the status. Um, however, both of his sons, both of um, William's sons were knights, uh, and they both died fighting uh, in France. Um, so his, uh, his elder son, Sir Thomas, died of dysentery after being invalided home from the siege of Harford. He actually died in England. Uh, you sometimes uh, counter references of him being killed at Agincourt, but it doesn't seem to be what happened. Um, his younger son, Sir John, also died or was killed in France sometime in or before 1429, but we don't really know much more than that. Another just interesting point about William is his income. Uh, there were 
very wealthy esquires uh, in, uh, in this period um, who had incomes as great or greater than many knights. Uh, when William's estates were assessed uh, quite some time after his death, um, when they were still held by his widow, around 1445, they were worth 107 pounds. And a number of William's lands and possessions by that time had been passed to others. So we can assume, I think, that his own income was, was somewhat greater, although we can't say how much greater. And let's look a little bit more at his effigy. Um, having, you know, having investigated the real material of armor and how it works practically, as well as the sculptures, I, I never stopped being struck by how precisely the effigies capture not just the appearance of the armor and the various different materials that it's made out of, but also the behavior of those materials, the, the varying textures. If you look here, one, very, one, uh, one thing, interesting detail you, you normally see on good effigies of this period is the male. This is the aventail that's hung from the bottom of the bassinet, the helmet. Um, and it hangs down over the shoulders to protect the shoulders and the neck. Um, and it's, uh, avatails are invariably lined. If you look sometimes in, in art, little artistic details where you can see the inside, you usually get this sense of a strong, tough, upholstered material underneath the male. The male is not functioning on its own. If you look at the way the male behaves on the figure, it drops straight down from the chin and it has a very substantial body to it. Even though he's not showing you the lining, except sometimes if you look carefully right at the edges, they've undercut it very cleverly to show the lining as well. Um, you can see at the bottom, the, the male seems to be turning under itself. And that's a natural effect of a lined atom <coughs> that the lining is stiff, and when you lean, you may lean forward a bit, your, your head leans forward as if it's being pushed forward by a cushion or the helm, in the case of the effigy, uh, the male rolls forward on the lining. It's stitched down all the, all the way around. And that's, ex that's the subtle kind of behavioral thing that the effigies capture very well. And, and if you know what you're looking at, they almost fool you, and you almost, your, 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 your picture of this figure almost blurs from a piece of alabaster to a real armored man lying there before you. And, and this effect would, of course, been very much more present when uh, the figure was painted uh, with all of its polychrome decoration and gilding and looking very much more lifelike indeed. Um, and the work that I've been doing over the last 15 years or so has, has really been about using the effigies to reconstruct the precise design and mechanics of these armors. And I believe that it's a testament to the quality of the work, the superlative realism in an age when we don't necessarily associate realism with the art form in the way that we might do uh, uh, later. But, um, you know, you really can understand quite a lot of the mechanics of the way these things work from, from looking at the effigies. Um, it was normal in this period to still wear uh, a textile surcoat, the heraldic surcoat or coat armor, over the body armor. And uh, on the one hand, you would think that if they're wearing a textile coat over the, the body armor, that would be a problem for armor researchers because there's a huge area of the most important part of the armor that's covered and obscured, and you can't see the rivets and the buckles and all the things that we're interested in. But again, what I'm really, what I, what I'm, I'm really struck by looking at, at good quality effigies is how they're so good at showing what's underneath. They, they take it as a challenge to show, to imply textile overlaying metal or, or other materials. <coughs> so you generally see this very round, this round, uh, almost spherical shape to the upper body, which stops at, at the natural waist, just below the ribs. Um, you have a very, very strong sense of a solid breastplate underneath. And then there's a very sharp transition where it cuts along a very well-defined line and then drops straight down. And the, the lower body is much slenderer and held in and tied in. Um, and, that, and that's uh, this, 
you can get a good idea of what is meant to be under there. And of course, an investigation of the effigy, the effigies in the context of what other forms of evidence there are and what we know what was going on elsewhere in Europe, we can get a pretty good idea of the kind of thing that is being worn underneath. But we need encouragement from the skill of the carver um, that he, what he is showing is consistent with what we are uh, establishing elsewhere. Uh, they generally spend quite a lot of time paying attention to the mechanical constructions of the plates. They're very concerned to put buckles and rivets and straps and decoration all in the places where you would expect it to be. And again, also suggesting the mail that is worn underneath the plate armor as well as over the top of it. Um, this is actually one of the main places where the armor of the English, which looks superficially identical for most part to the armor of the French, one place where it probably differs, the, the general practice of what form of male garments are worn uh, under the plate armor. Some of you may, may, may know from, from the older uh, lit standard literature on armor that you often get chapters split up into the age of male, and the age of male then transitions into the age of plate as if one material is thrown out in favor of something else, as if one is a newer replacement for the older, and it isn't, isn't the case at all. The age of mail never ended, and it still hasn't. You can still see fishmongers in East London wearing lots of mail to protect themselves against their very sharp uh, fish filleting knives. Um, but anyway, so they, they, the, we know from a number of the accounts of the battle that the, that the French wore, or many of them chose to wore full coats of mail, like this or like that, uh, under their full plate armor. Uh, and this is an interesting point. It's not saying that they only wore male shirts and not wore plate armors. It takes it as a given that they're wearing their full plate armor and full male shirts as well. Um, while the English, we know from the, from, from the old the inventories of the Tower of London now, um, through uh, very important research by Tom Richardson at the, at the Royal Armouries, that by the middle of the 14th century, the English were busy, as they say, breaking male shirts to create sleeves of mail and skirts and vo voiders and gussets. They were chopping up their male shirts as early as the middle of the 14th century so that they were only wearing the pieces of mail that covered the gaps. And they were choosing not to wear huge amounts of mail under the primary areas of their plate armor. And that has a, that has a weight of what that means, actually, is we taught up all the different options. In this period, armor that is visually and superficially exactly the same can weigh as little as about 20 kilos in total and as much as 35 kilos. In fact, one man taking the pieces in his personal armor could configure his armor in lighter or heavier configurations depending on what he expected to be doing. The same armor can be worn in different ways, combining the pieces in different ways. Uh, and my reading of the Chronicles suggests that the French elected to wear their armors in the heavier configurations, but essentially they were wearing the same equipment as the, as the English. And if you think about it, that's not a stupid thing to do. You know, they knew they were facing 5,000 plus English archers who were going to be shooting a lot of arrows at them. Wearing your, your armor in the heavier configuration makes quite a lot of sense. The fact that the ground conditions on the day didn't favor them and there were many other problems with the way they fought the, the day is, a, is another matter. But we can't lay their defeat on, uh, we can't blame it on their bad choice of outdated or irrelevant equipment. It was exactly the right equipment for the day. Interestingly, the accounts also say that the shooting, once the advance, the main advance began, the sh began, the shooting of the English became so heavy that the French were concerned that the sights and the sides of their visors would be pierced. They don't say the skulls of their helmets, they don't say that they were worried about their breastplates failing, they were concerned about the gaps, the little places where you need to breathe and you need to see it, those are the places where Arrows can catch, gain purchase, and then perhaps have a chance of getting through to the man inside. 
this is just another uh, illustration of what the effigies appear to be showing. They often show the buckles in the right place, the straps in the right place. Uh, the, sh the shoulder defenses of this period tend to be integrated uh, into the arm defenses. In, in later periods, they were separate pieces, but uh, predominantly in this period, it's all one construction. It all goes on all together. And another interesting thing I should point out about the analysis of the, the style of armor and the way it evolves that we observe looking at the effigies in isolation, if we then take what we've learned and compare it to what is described in the inventories and the special languages, the special descriptions that they use in inventories and, and other armor-related accounts, the, the precise nature of armor at this time matches in remarkable detail with the, the written descriptions. It's all incredibly consistent. The effigies are showing you exactly what the documents are describing in quite some detail. And also, I said there's no English armor surviving, and I guess I should say in, in absolute accuracy that there's almost no English armor surviving. There's quite a lot of little bits and pieces. The gauntlets of this period were made up of um, a couple of larger plates for the main structures of the hand and wrist, and then lots of little plates for the hands. The English were always very concerned to maintain their full dexterity in their hands, in both hands. They're fighting almost exclusively on foot, and they need to be ambidextrous and fighting with two-handed weapons. They need the symmetrical designs of armor with good, uh, good dexterity. And there's a number of finger plates surviving. Uh, a number of finger plates have been found in London um, by people uh, looking at the, the shores of the Thames and digging up various parts of old London. Uh, these are a few. There's, there's more of these in, um, in the stores of the Museum of London. I found quite a number, actually, rummaging through the um, basement of the Museum of London. But this is a, a representative sample. You can see, interestingly, the love that, that, that many of these plates are made of, of gilt copper or copper alloy, yellow metal of some kind. And that gives you a sense of, of the richness that we'll encounter a little more as we go on. Um, the leg armor of these, these effigies is very distinctive and very consistent, again, with how the English were fighting. Um, we don't, when we, we look at the history of armor in general terms, we don't expect them to wear, be wearing plates on the backs of their legs. And we don't expect them to be wearing mail on the backs of their knees. Um, this is, uh, but this is the case. This is what the effigies show, and we have it described in inventories as well. They refer to closed cuisses fully enclosed legs, uh, upper legs as well as lower legs. They refer to voiders for the cuisse, these, these voiders for the backs of the legs. And actually, there are a few um, uh, continental accounts. Uh, there's an interesting Italian account in the book. I, I don't remember anything anymore because I've written it all down somewhere. Um, but the, the Italian account, which expresses um, um, great uh, 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 he remarks uh, strongly on how well armored the English knights fighting in Italy actually are. He's writing in the late 14th century, the age of Hawkwood and so forth. Um, he, this is an Italian impressed by how much armor the English wear and how well armored they are. Um, and uh, in some cases, we find Italian knights seeking permission from their commanders to arm themselves in the English manner, which is very interesting, whatever you, whatever you think that means. Um, there's a, uh, although some, some like we should say, although we have to be clear, Glenn, that these are not men lying there dead in their armor. These are sculptures, and there are limits to them. And sometimes, depending on the skill or the, the, of the artist or his budget, Sometimes they don't model the armor quite in three dimensions, um, but, but sometimes they do. There's enough of them to show that those, the man is, is really there as, it, as it's described in, in the documents. Uh, another thing about the English is that they're very keen on foot plates. Not everybody wore plates on their feet consistently in the early 15th century. The English not only wore, almost universally wore complete and closed plates for their feet, um, they also had a number of supplementary defenses of different kinds. They're very concerned, again, to have voiders on their ankles to protect the gap between the greave and the sabaton. They have different configurations of plates on the back, on the heels, and they have you know, reinforcing overplates that go on in this period. 
This is the, 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 the overriding um, impression is that this is armor very, very um, uh, uh, carefully designed and, uh, uh, and specially designed for fighting on foot. It's not that you can't fight on horseback in it, you can, uh, but it's not optimized for fighting on horseback. It's, it's optimized for fighting on foot. And there's a few examples. Then one thing I must say about the effigies too, after having looked at, well, certainly 230 and a lot of 14th century ones as well, um, they, they, they are remarkably individualistic. Um, we, we really have to get away from the idea that they were produced as sort of generic works. And that, you know, the, the Duke of Norfolk will go to the Chelston workshop and give, say, give me a number six body and a number three head. These are highly, highly uh, uh, individualized, custom-built works of very personal art form. Um, they, they are not primarily about, they're often seen as, as kind of um, glorified tombstones. That are primarily about in this, you know, the, uh, the remembrance of the deceased person. But that is not that they have that function, and they do create a, a fantastic um, uh, dynastic statement or effect in a church that has successive generations of effigies in it. But the primary function of effigies seems to have been as a strong motivator and indeed a pleading for intercessionary prayers. Uh, the, the, again, the belief is that this, a, a soul that might end up in heaven might still have to spend thousands and thousands of years in the kind of nothing realm of purgatory. And intercessionary prayers can cut time in purgatory and speed a soul's journey uh, to heaven. And this is a very strong, uh, very, very literal belief. So the, the, the art of the effigy is really you know, the art that will literally save your soul. Uh, and this explains not only why they're so highly advanced in terms of their uh, representation of particular individuals, but why so much money was spent on them. We'll talk more about that later. As far as the sort of the legacy of, and, and, and remembrance of Agincourt or our, our modern conception of it, effigies have actually exerted a very powerful indirect effect on the way almost everyone remembers this battle, whether we know it or not. Uh, for example, let's not forget the very profound effect that Lawrence Olivier's 1944 film has had on the way not only do we remember and conceive of the Shakespearean play, but also the real historical events. This is a film that actually goes a very long way to utterly confusing the distinction between the play, the Elizabethan, play and, uh, and the real events. Um, Lawrence Olivier was fortunate to have the um, curator of arms and armor of the Wallace collection as his historical advisor. Uh, not, not me, obviously, but my, <laughs> my predecessor and also former director of the Wallace collection, Sir James Mann, who was one of the foremost experts on uh, medieval Renaissance arms and armor of the 20th century. He's also the author of a lot of the foundation literature for the subject that we still uh, rely on. And Mann pointed the direct art director of the film, uh, Roger First, towards a very important book, uh, Monumental Effigies of Great Britain by Charles Stothard, which some of you will know, obviously. Uh, and Stothard's <coughs> book was used as a key design reference. Olivier's heavily annotated copy of Stothard, the copy used for the production, is still in the British Library. Um, they, they, they perhaps use the effigies, this particular effigy is the precise one used uh, to design Olivier's armor. Um, they, they, they use them perhaps a little too well. Um, the, the king's crown would not have been a glorified hall. Uh, they've, they've, they've wanted to get, stay as close to the effigy as possible, and so they've stuck a crown on top of that. That's not how it would have worked at all. But, but I, I can't fault them for, for uh, for their, their, their efforts. Also, the king himself should never be worn wearing the SS collar. Uh, this is a livery collar worn by the servants of the monarch. Uh, it is a statement of loyalty to the House of Lancaster. Henry V is the House of Lancaster, so he generally doesn't need to demonstrate loyalty to himself, as far as I'm aware. 
Um, but Olivier was not the first one to look at effigies as an inspiration for what Agincourt would have looked like. This is another highly influential image that you, you will encounter in the literature if you, if you do any work on the battle. Um, uh, uh, it's, uh, uh, again, using effigies of this time very carefully. This one, and certainly Henry himself, are, uh, and the figures in the background, are all based on these effigies. And the effigies, the interpretation of them, has led to the common misperception, actually, that the English off, always fought over the face. Olivier fought over the face because you needed to see that it was Lawrence <laughs> Olivier. Because no one would have gone to the film if Olivier wasn't in it. But, um, but uh, you know, the, as we said before, the English, in fact, were renowned for being as heavily armored as the human body can possibly be. And they would not then leave their faces exposed. And we know from the, from the eyewitness accounts that Henry V wore a helmet with a crown and a visor. It says that. And visors are clearly uh, part of, of English equipment. It's just on the effigies they leave them off because they need the face exposed. Uh, that's the need. You put the visor down and you lose all human contact and you, you become dehumanized. And the whole point of an effigy is to, is to, is to keep the humanity of the person foremost. So, um, there, are, there are examples of visor or helm and effigies, but they're very early and very, very rare. So this is the second effigy that I'd like you to call your attention to especially. This is uh, Sir Edmund Thorpe. Um, unlike William Willicote, he was a soldier of very long experience uh, in royal service. As early as the 1380s, he's serving in, uh, in the English Navy, uh, he's present in the Ireland campaign in 1399. Uh, in 1400, he was appointed mayor of, uh, of Bordeaux. Uh, on the 1415 campaign, he was a lieutenant to Thomas Beaufort, Earl of Dorset. Uh, and he probably remained with Beaufort as part of the garrison at Harfleur after the town fell in, in September. Uh, it, he was there at least for a few months and then probably went back to England. He was certainly not present at Agincourt, as, as far as we can tell. And he's often, in, in, in modern artworks, he's often shown as present by Henry V's side at Agincourt, but he, as far as we can tell, he wasn't there. Uh, he was also very an active part of the 1417 campaign, the, you know, uh, probably much more important second invasion of Normandy. Uh, the invasion where Henry V intended to stay. And uh, at the muster in Southampton in July of 1417, uh, Sir Edmund Thorpe had a personal re retinue of nine men at arms and 33 archers, uh, staying reasonably close to that one to three ratio that was so important. Uh, in October of 1417, uh, Thorpe was at Alençon with Henry V's army, and he's recorded as having uh, being encamped with his retinue before uh, the town of Louvier uh, on the 9th of June, 1418, when the English uh, began their siege of that city, or that town. And he had apparently was dead before, sometime before the town surrendered on the 23rd of June. Um, we don't know whether he died or was killed or what happened, but that's where he met his end. Uh, just to inform, this is, the illustration of this effigy is one of the, the highlights of Charles Stothard's work. He not only gives his typical uh, line drawing schematic of the, the, the top of the tomb, he also offers one of his rare uh, watercolored um, uh, reduced uh, studies of various details and things. And, and this is why this particular effigy is so much better known than others of its, of its class. This is the one that Stothard favored in his work. Uh, just a, another word about Stothar. His work is, is rightly remembered. It's a, quite an extraordinary thing. I don't, I wish I knew how Stothar did these drawings. Um, because you know, there, there's, no, there's no mezzanine level or balcony that he could have been lying on looking down when he drew this. But if you overlay this on top of a, uh, a photograph of the real thing, his proportions and, and, and every, his, his accuracy is really remarkable. 
Uh, this one was taken with a boom, and the camera really is floating over the top of the effigy. But it's a remarkable job. So, um, you know, Stothar is rightly still referred to. He still is a reasonably reliable source, although it's always best to look at the real thing. Um, the Thorpe effigy is also a, um, a great way to explore some of the very personal attributes that these effigies have. A number of the hardcore Lancastrians, of course, are wearing the SS collar. Um, there's one survivor in the Museum of London. The, the ones on the effigies are interesting, though, because they're not made in the same way as the civilian ones. The civilian ones are all metal, and they're, they're chains, essentially, linked together. The effigies show the S's as, as individual badges that are mounted onto a leather or textile backing. Um, and this is shown very clearly over and over again. And there are a couple of effigies that wear the all, the all metal kind. And so you know that there's a difference, and it's not just some kind of artistic invention. Um, and these are, these are, I believe, the way they're worn, they're worn very tightly onto the helmet as well. They don't hang about the shoulders. They're, very, they're a very practical variant of the idea of the livery collar if you want to fight it, if you want to be on the battlefield wearing your Lancastrian uh, regalia. That's a perfect adjustment. Uh, to the form and, and this this uh, idea of showing what is, is practical and what is real, um, it's it's really remarkable. Also, many of the effigies' heads rest on their helms, and here is another good point of comparison because we have one surviving: um, the helm of Henry V himself, the funerary helm carried at his funeral in 1422, uh, and which will be much more discussed in, in much greater detail at the Westminster Conference on the 28th of. October later this year. Um, this is a remarkable thing, and it's a it's a very it's a very important comparison to the effigies for lots of reasons. Um, it's it's of the same style, very closely similar style to the ones that appear right in the Agincourt period effigies specifically. This style of helm could have been current as and been used in joust as early as the 1380s, but they don't appear on the monuments until right around the time of Agincourt. Uh, which is very interesting. And on the monuments, you see them decorated with copper alloy or gilded uh, borders, inscribed with this very characteristic quatrefoil pattern, and there is one surviving in reality. There it is. The effigies show exactly what really existed. Uh, the Thorpe effigy is also unique in carrying uh, another livery badge, uh, the, um, the swan badge. There's the famous Dunstable Swan. Um, Thorpe's variant, this is of course a common Lancastrian um, a device, uh, he's, he's using the, the, the swan with the, with the spread wings, which of course is, is still very well known. You, the Dunstable swan I think is slightly unusual in, in having its wings folded rather than, rather than spread. But that's the only effigy where he has that, he's wearing that badge. So this is, again, an individual statement about his career and his loyalty and, and his associations. Another very important pageant court veteran, of course, was Richard de Vere, uh, the 11th Earl of Oxford. Um, <clears throat> he, uh, the, the Oxford was one of the peers who presided over the Southampton plotters. He was a commander at pageant court under Humphrey, Duke of Gloucester. Um, and he was, uh, he was nominated as a Knight of Garter in 1416 in recognition, presumably, of his, of his uh, presence at Agincourt. Interestingly, De Vere, along with um, the Earl Marshal, the Duke of Norfolk, and uh, Lord Camelot, was one of the three uh, official royal representatives who received the Emperor Sigismund to England in 1416. And all three of those representatives were ag famous Agincourt veterans, interestingly. Uh, that can't have been uh, a coincidence. Um, again, by this period now, we're looking at someone who's very well equipped to, in the latest style of the period. The helmet, as you can see by this point, uh, for those who were interested or could afford it, had, had become considerably more advanced now. Um, rather than just the skull of the helmet um, reinforced with a male aventail, you now have uh, various uh, combinations of neck plates. The, um, the old bassinet with aventail is an extraordinarily successful design and, and lasted for a very long time. These are two of the best examples surviving. Uh, but it has a, 
it has a crucial weakness. Um, the protecting of the throat is a design problem in, in the whole history of armor. Uh, you know, the throat is you know, very easily damaged. It, you can be killed by a thrust to it, whether it pierces the skin or not. The esophagus can be crushed. Uh, it's very, very susceptible to damage. But it's hard to protect with hard armor because you need to move your head and look around, and it's a, it's a problem. Um, but certainly by this period, the problem needed to be dealt with in a different way. You had the, the uh, appearance of the, the lance rest, which meant that uh, knights on horseback could hit each other in the throat harder than ever before. And if you're not wearing anything more than the bassinet and abintel, then that's what can happen to you. Um, so it was one of, the, one of a number of, of well-motivated advances in armor that was occurring in the time of, of Agincourt. And the effigies show not only the completed, uh, the completed great bassinet, as it would be called later, they show all of the stages in between, the various experiments with different kinds of neck plates integrated into the existing technology, uh, experiments that you see in the art elsewhere uh, in, in many places also. And that's what you end up with. These are, are two of the survivors that are uh, contemporary of the period. The great bassinet, which has replaced the male with, with hard steel plates. So now the head can move inside, but the helmet tends to stay quite static on the head. Another interesting uh, uh, detail of this effigy brings up the question of heraldic display and the different ways that it could be achieved. Uh, of course, it was still very current at the time to wear the full surcoat or coat armor that we saw on, on, Will on uh, William Willowcoats um, and on Thorpe. But here, something else is going on. Um, you see the De Vere star in the place where it should be, but he's not God a surcoat on his lower body, as you would expect. You can see all the technical detail, all the plates and the hinges and everything are visible. So this is uncovered plate armor, uh, which is interesting. I think he's probably wearing something like this, which is sort of a partial surcoat. Um, it's there to display the key information, but he also wants to keep his glamorous, shiny plate armor as exposed as possible. And that's a fashionable trend that we start observing in the Agincourt period as well, the desire not to cover all of this fantastic new polished steel armor, the so-called all-white armor that is displayed on the very famous brass of Thomas Lord Camoys, another of the, uh, of the command commanders of Agincourt. Uh, Lord Camoys uh, had, again, a very long career as a soldier. In 1380, he was fighting in France and knighted by Thomas of Woodstock. 1385, he was fighting in Scotland. He was always strongly loyal to Henry IV from the very beginning of the reign. And in 1415, he helped plan, plan the campaign. He was another of the Southampton Plot judges. He commanded the rear guard at Agincourt uh, that was um, deployed uh, on the field as the left wing. Um, and in 1416, again, he was made a Knight of the Garter uh, and uh, in, in recognition of the campaign, we assume. Also, interestingly, his, his second wife, who, uh, who is represented here on his brass, is, is a very important person in her own right, historically uh, quite important. She was uh, Elizabeth Mortimer, a uh, gentle Kate of, of Shakespeare's uh, Henry IV, Part One, the widow of uh, Henry Hotspur. Percy. It's interesting when you, when you really start looking at all of these, these effigies and their characters, how inter, interleaved all of their lives actually, actually are. Um, the Cowboys brass has rightly been described as the greatest surviving brass in the 15th century. Um, it's a remarkable thing. And it, it takes a very particular stance on the way it shows, it shows the armor. Um, Cowboys is an old man by the time he dies. He's an old veteran. You would expect him to be somewhat conservative in his equipment, but he isn't at all. He's not wearing the surcoat at all. That's displayed. His heraldry is displayed elsewhere. Again, he's got that tight uh, battlefield um, livery collar. He's also no longer wearing the knightly belt and plates, or what is rightly called the arse girdle in 15th century, late 14th and early 15th century documents. He's discarded that now. You, you get a real sense of the brass that he is a he is a follower of the latest fashion, despite his uh, despite his age. 
And of course, as Anne mentioned, there's the, um, there's the wonderful hand uh, clasp hands motif, which appears on this one as well. Uh, this is uh, uh, the very extraordinary um, monument to Rafe Green, again a squire, never knighted, and his wife Catherine, another very strong supporter of Henry IV in the House of Lancaster, probably a bit of an overcompensator because his father was, Sir Henry, was a favorite of Richard II, so he was executed for treason. And uh, uh, Green seems to have you know, worked very hard to uh, establish and maintain uh, status and reputation under the Lancastrians. He was an esquire of body to Henry IV, again also a sheriff with a huge annual income. Um, the interesting thing also, the most interesting thing about this effigy, or one of the most significant things, is that it's the only one that survives that is also documented. We have the original contract for its creation. So it's an enormously important piece of evidence for how effigies were commissioned, how the process worked, uh, and, and, and how the results were achieved. It's interesting for what it, as much as for what it doesn't say, as for what it does say. There's extraordinary detail in this monument, the heraldry and so forth, but none of that is stipulated in the contract. And you, you get the sense that the, the executors or the, the, who, or the subject himself worked very closely with the artists on a personal, uh, on a personal level to guide and influence the creation of the monument. Uh, Green's heraldry is very interesting too. We have to remember that squires in England, um, non, you know, men at arms who hadn't been knighted, had only been allowed to wear their own personal coats of arms since the 1380s, since it was permitted by Richard II. Um, and uh, this particular esquire seems very, very anxious to display all of those chivalric rights on his monument. He interestingly got in a, in a fight, a heraldic um, argument or legal, um, uh, uh, legal disagreement during the 1405 campaign in Wales. Um, Green and Sir John Downingbridge uh, appeared before the king's tent to obtain a ruling in their personal dispute over the right to bear the arms argent across and grailed gules. That's it there. Uh, Downingbridge claimed that his family had carried these arms since the conquest, and he demanded an immediate trial by combat to decide the issue, as he said, without delay. Um, Green didn't think, seem to think that was a good idea, and he deferred instead to the king's personal ruling on the matter. Uh, and the king, however, was intent to keep peace within his retainers, uh, among his retainers in, in, during the campaign, so he decreed that both should continue to wear this coat of arms until the case could receive a proper hearing before the Constable and Marshal of England. Uh, but we don't actually know what happened, or at least I don't know. Well, maybe, the, maybe the good York Herald can tell you what happened. But the effigies tell you something. Um, this is uh, Sir John Dallenbridge's father, and he's quite clearly wearing it in the 1380s. And this is Sir John's own effigy, slightly in a more dilapidated uh, condition than Rafe Green's. But you can see the engrailing of the cross that runs right down the middle of the effigy. So he's still wearing it there. He has it as well on his effigy. But he's been forced to quarter it with a, with a checky design. So perhaps that had something to do with the ruling. You can continue to wear it, but you have to difference it from your opponent in some way. Uh, an interesting question. I'll move on a bit because we're running out of time. Finally, I did want to say uh, something about Sir William Philip, 6th Baron Barbarolf, um, described as a valiant soldier in Henry V's wars in France. He was a very important courtier and one of the most powerful noblemen in my local area, East Anglia. This is actually the closest energy from, uh, to my house, so I go and see it quite regularly. Um, so it was going to make the cut in the end. Um, he was the nephew of Sir Thomas Erpingham, one of the great commanders of the Agincourt campaign, Constable of Norwich Castle. Um, in 1415, Sir William was contracted to serve with nine men-at-arms and 30 archers, um, although it seems that only 13, uh, 36 men actually embarked with him, so a few got left behind for some reason. Um, the campaign for Sir William was marred by the death of his brother, Sir John Philip, who um, who Anne already mentioned in reference to his brass, who died at Art Fleur on the 2nd of October. 
Uh, but Sir William continued to march on with the king towards Calais and did actually fight at Agincourt. And again in 1417, he, he raised a force of 85 men at arms and fought throughout the second invasion of Normandy. Um, and uh, he was nominated as a Knight of the Garter at the Siege of Rouen in November 1418, Captain of Harfleur in the 1420s, treasurer of Henry V's household, and responsible for Henry V's funeral arrangements and the escorting of Henry V's body back to England. So another hugely important Lancastrian uh, figure. And his, uh, because of this, the career of this subject, this effigy is one of the most commonly referred to in studies of Agincourt in particular. Um, he appears in a lot, of, you know, a lot of books, a lot of illustrations, and he's referred to. The problem is that he lived for quite a long time after and didn't die until 1441. And the effigy is, without exception, always of the time of creation, not the you know, time of a, of a person's heyday or, or, or whatever. So this, this effigy couldn't, was probably not made any earlier than about 1436 or 37, uh, and possibly a couple of years after death, but probably no more than that. The given rule, if you know the time of death, um, is give or take five years, is the general rule for dating effigies, as far as I can tell. Um, so the armor that we see on this great um, veteran of the Agincourt campaign is much more advanced, far more advanced, than anything that you would have seen on the battlefield of Agincourt. Uh, for most, the body armor has developed a lot more. The, the, um, the biggest advance in the 1430s was the significant lengthening of the skirt. So it's now moving quite close to the mid-thigh, and even past the mid-thigh towards the knees. Uh, and this is a measure taken because of, of the weakness, a, a major weak point in an armored man, which is the groin. Uh, the groin is where the Duke of Gloucester was stabbed at Agincourt. And there are a number of other examples uh, where men are instructed to stab uh, armored men in the legs or in the groin because it's an area that's difficult to armor. And I can't help wondering if, if that particular high profile injury or other high profile injuries like it highlighted the need and stimulated a, an advance in, in English armor design. It's, a, it's an interesting thing to wonder. Um, when, when famous people get hurt, we pay more attention. <laughs> um, so this is a, is a spectacular effigy. Notice here, he's wearing a more courtly, uh, chain-only form of, of livery collar. Um, just to, and, and the S's are also backwards, so maybe the, uh, the carver wasn't quite sure what he was doing, or just got confused, but um, otherwise the effigy is absolutely spectacular in its, in its physical qualities. And this also, again, getting back to the way we've remembered the battle and the images that influence our imagination, um, the Bardolf effigy appears on the battle, the imagined battlefield of Agincourt and a number of other illustrations, foremost this one. Um, this is not Bardolf from his heraldry, this is someone else, but he's quite clearly wearing an armor that was based by the artist on this particular effigy, wrongly. He met, there's no reason why he should have known. This was in the Victorian period, they knew much less about armor, and he knew this person fought at Agincourt, therefore it seemed like a good reference, but he's wearing futuristic armor in those circumstances, unfortunately. So, in conclusion, I'd just like to stress again that it's been really possible to build up a very, very detailed picture of the year-by-year, -year, decade by decade evolution of armor throughout the Hundred Years War period by looking at these effigies. And um, it, in my estimation, they've become only more remarkable the more that I've studied them. Uh, and uh, of course, this is a study, this is a, this evolution is something continued up into the second half of the, of the 15th century, uh, but that's a story for another time. Thank you.